Scotia, Premier Stephen McNeil. Du Nouveau-Brunswick, le Premier ministre, Brian Gallet. From PEI, Premier Wade McLaughlin. And from Newfoundland, Premier Dwight Ball. Annie Par, your moderator, the MP for Long Range Mountains, Goody Hutchings. Well, good morning, good morning, bonjour, cher ami. Je m'appelle Goody Hutchings. Je suis député de ma conscription, oh, that's a hard one from a Newfoundlander in French. Circonscription <laughs> to the Long Range Mountains and Terre Neuve and Labrador. Je suis enchanté d'être le moderatrice et ce événement qui regroupe les quatre premiers ministres d'Atlantic Canada. Great. So, folks, welcome again to Atlantic Canada. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks, Way. So welcome to Atlantic Canada and welcome to Nova Scotia. I'm proud to be here this morning with my colleagues and friends, the premiers of, of, of the Atlantic provinces. I'm going to give you a little geography lesson. Who in the room is not from Atlantic Canada? So in 1949, something special happened. Newfoundland joined Canada. That's right. Before that, it was referred to as the Maritimes. But after 1949, we now refer to it as Atlantic Canada. These four gentlemen here represent 2.3 million people in a landmass of 500,000 square kilometers. That's a big piece of territory. And in total, I hope Minister LeBlanc hears this, they look after 31,756 kilometers of coastline. That's, that's why we're called the Atlantic. Each of these premiers not only have a connection to their province, and their party beliefs, but they have a connection to our beliefs as federal liberals as well. Let me just tell you a little bit more in detail. Premier Stephen McNeil of Nova Scotia, our host premier, in Stephen's election night speech, he said he was inspired by the families he met while campaigning across the province. You've told me about your hopes and your dreams for a Nova Scotia where your children and grandchildren can prosper. And I share that dream. And as liberals, we all share that dream as well. And Premier Gallant from New Brunswick. We know where you're from. Brian understands that small and medium-sized businesses are the backbone of the economy and are the backbone of our country. Brian ran two small businesses while studying in order to pay for his tuition. Premier Wade McLaughlin from Prince Edward Island. Wade has a plan to grow the population of his island, not only by immigration, by convincing islanders to come back home. I think he's going to share a little more about that later. And I love this line. He says, you can probably get five houses for the price of one in Toronto, but a much better time will be had in PEI. And my premier, Premier Dwight Ball from Newfoundland and Labrador. Dwight was brought up with the values of hard work and community and always to contribute. And trust me, I know his mother, that's true. And other than one other Newfoundlander, which is my dad, I have never found another who believes in Newfoundlanders and Labradorians more. He considers the 500,000 people that he represents, his people, and his advisors every day. I'm going to tell you one other little thing these folks have in common. They're all pet lovers. And those of you that know me, I talk about my dogs all the time. So pets really teach us leadership. They see the best in people. They believe in hard work. They get their paws dirty. They always get enjoyment out of the little things. They always make, get, make others happy, makes them happy. And they are fiercely loyal, which I think we, bodes well for these. So in case you didn't know, Dwight has a dog, Toby. Brian has a dog, Blaze. Wade, I kind of have a real affinity for. He has two Portuguese water dogs, Zorro and Hilario. I have two porties, as you know. And Stephen has two felines. Stephen has two cats, CJ and Kitty. I think you've got a story about Kitty. Well, my daughter is over here, Colleen. Why don't you stand up, Colleen? <laughs> Colleen and I were campaigning in 2013, and we're right when we were, I was asked by a reporter, do you have any animals at home? And I said, yes, I have two cats. We had a dog named Murphy, but unfortunately Murphy was no longer with us, but we had two cats. CJ is one of them, named after Colleen and Jeffrey. And I said, we have another cat named Lucky. Lucky came to us, our son was on the golf course, and he found Lucky at the golf course, someone had dropped him off, and he brought the cat home, and I named the cat Lucky. So I go through the interview, I get on the bus, and Colleen says, Dad, 
you don't have a cat named Lucky. I said, what do you mean I don't have a cat named Lucky? Of course I have a cat named Lucky. She said, no, you don't. It's not your cat. It was Jeffrey's cat, and he named it Kitty. I said, well, listen, call your mother and your brother and tell them for the next 30 days they got a cat named Lucky. <laughs> the things we do on the campaign trail. So, folks, this morning our topic, our, our, it's called Working Together for Atlantic Canada. And we know how important it is for every region to work together, but here in the East, we know, and these gentlemen are true testaments that, that working together does pay off. So I'm gonna ask each of the Premiers the same question, starting with you, Premier McNeil, this morning. What are some of the biggest accomplishments and challenges that your province faces? Well, in 2013, when Nova Scotians gave us the privilege to govern this province, we came in with a half a billion dollar deficit. Uh, we had no migration of young people and our population was declining. I'm very proud of the fact of the hard work uh, of so many Nova Scotians who joined us in this journey, whether it's uh, the labor movement, uh, private sector, we've been able to deliver our third balanced budget, which was a, a no uh, a small feat uh, for our province. Uh, the last two years we've had more young people move into our province than move out, uh, and we've seen a tremendous growth in new Nova Scotians who are coming here looking for hopes uh, to build a new life here. Yesterday, many of you would have seen uh, Dad, who was here, a uh, tremendous story, the Syrian refugees and peace by chocolate. Uh, those are the things over the last couple of years that have been tremendous, but, but we've only been able to achieve that, quite frankly, is that every uh, Nova Scotian has seen themselves as part of this movement uh, to turn this economy around, uh, to see the fact that not only are we an important part of Atlantic Canada, we're an important province in the Federation, and we have a significant role to play, and, and the opportunities are great here, uh, not just inside of this great convention center, but if you've seen outside of this city in rural parts of our province, uh, this province is actually on the move. Great, thank you. Premier Gallant. Merci beaucoup. Premièrement, je veux remercier Stephen et tout le monde de la Nouvelle-Écosse pour l'accueil que nous avons donné ici à Halifax. And I certainly want to take a moment to say that if anybody doubted that Atlantic Canada could host a biennial and that it would be a success, I think we answered that question loud and clear. So congratulations to everyone involved. Uh, for us, uh, we have many of the same challenges the rest of the country has, the rest of the region has. W one thing that's certainly top of mind for me as Premier is trying to tackle a challenge that I think we have in the Western world, uh, which is income inequality. And I believe that income inequality is one of the reasons why we've seen some of the right-wing movements uh, in North America, in the European Union, and even on Canadian soil that we've seen over the last few years. So that would be one of the challenges we're certainly focused on, and I would say one of the greatest accomplishments that our government has been able to do, and I think one of the things that I'm the most proud of is the elements and the efforts that we put in to address income inequality, raising the minimum wage, uh, advancing pay equity. We had the second lowest gender wage gap of all the provinces in the country, which we're very proud of. There's still a gap, so there's more to be done, but we're proud that we're on the right uh, track. The investments we're making with the federal government to help people with affordable housing so the vulnerable can have a place to call home. Uh, the CPP enhancements, helping our seniors be able to retire with dignity. But with all that said, the one that I'm the most proud of, because I do think it's the best investment we can make for the future prosperity of our region, our country, and the world, and it's the best social equalizer, it's the investments we're making in education. Uh, absolutely. We, we're investing to increase our literacy skills, so we give individuals that fundamental skill that they need to help us grow our economy and for them to have a good quality of life. Investing in coding. Nous avons une génération qui sont confortables à utiliser la technologie. Nous voulons que la génération soit aussi confortable à créer la technologie. Uh, investments in free childcare for the families that need it the most, so their parents can their parents can go to work and they can go to school and the children can get the best start in life. Our investments to put trades back in our schools and probably one of my, uh, my most proudest accomplishments as Premier, the fact that those that need the most support can get free tuition when they study in New Brunswick. Wonderful, thank you for that, Brian. And kudos, exactly. The, the convention has been amazing. Uh, don't ever say Atlantic Canadians and Nova Scotians can't do anything. So, Premier McLaughlin, on to you and the red, uh, the red soiled island. 
Uh, merci, Goody, puis merci tout le monde d'être venu ce matin. Um, uh, I'd say the challenge, the overall that we deal with, and, and, the, and I might say the vocation we have in being in public life, is that that liberals share across the country, and that is to grow the economy, make it sustainable, and share the benefits in a way that will be further sustainable and meet uh, priority needs. And we've been doing that uh, in our province, like uh, Stephen, we're now on our third balanced budget. Uh, we're making big investments uh, this time around. And we're making it in social areas, we're making it in the economy, we're, we're actually made a very big investment in uh, education uh, this time, and of course, uh, you just run like everything to keep up with health. The, um, I think the, 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 key to, um, the key to what we're doing and what we're doing together in Atlantic Canada is to convince all of Atlantic Canada, to convince Canadians that you can do great things in small places. And that's exactly the kind where we're seeing the success and we're proud of that. Thank you, Goody. Wonderful, and certainly last but not least. Thank you, Goody, and I think for me, when I look back at the last just over two and a half years since becoming Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, I think most people across the country would recognize the physical situation that we, we took on when we took government in, in 2015. So we've been able to, first and foremost, put in place a vision for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. First of all, to establish a strong financial foundation. I will say that when you look at, uh, when you look at all provinces across Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador is still considered to be, by definition, a half province. So we do not get equalization in any form at all So when it comes to in transfer payments. So we are doing this really based on uh, the great wealth that we have in terms of uh, natural resources. When we took power, just, just a few, about a year before we took power, our economy was dependent on to 36% on oil royalties. Today, that's less than 15%. Uh, but I think what's, what I find most important for me and where I get uh, some of the things that we are most proud of are the investments that we've made in mental health and addictions in our province. And I will tell you, It is one of the reasons why I got in politics. I lived in a province that had not opened up a new mental health facility since 1855. Canada wasn't even a country at that time. So we were able to start a process to begin replacing that. And from all across the country now, national leaders are reaching out regularly and telling us that we are leading the way in how we are dealing with mental health and addictions in our provinces, putting it back into the communities where it belongs. One other thing. One other thing I just build on to what some of, the, uh, some of the other former premiers have said already is the investments that we made in education. Very early in our mandate, we started a complete review of the K-12 system with investments into the early childhood education. We already had the second lowest tuition rates uh, for post-secondary in the country, second only to Quebec, so we've been doing a very good job at that. So we finished the task force, and I will tell you right now that we are putting uh, transformative measures in place for the K-12 system, preparing our students for post-secondary education. So these are things that I've been proud of and what has been a very busy two and a half years. And it has been a busy two and a half years. We're going to go individually now, but one thing that these four premiers have been working on in partnership with their federal ministers and all the um, MPs from Atlantic Canada is something we refer to as the Atlantic Growth Strategy. So you four Premiers were in, uh, I believe it was New Brunswick last, and now you're headed to PEI this summer. So Premier Gallant, can you just tell the group here um, exactly what is the Atlantic Growth Strategy, but more importantly, how it's paying off and working as the four provinces working together to accomplish so much for Atlantic Canadians? C'est une stratégie concentrée sur la croissance économique, la croissance de notre population et l'amélioration de la qualité de vie pour les gens euh, des provinces de l'Atlantique. C'est une stratégie comme les autres, dans le sens que ça nous aide à diriger nos investissements et nos efforts pour faire croître l'économie, créer de l'emploi et aider les gens euh, de notre région. Mais je pense que l'élément fondamental derrière la stratégie, c'est la coopération et la collaboration à un niveau que nous n'avons jamais vu auparavant. Uh, the spirit behind the Atlantic Growth Strategy is really a level of cooperation and collaboration that we've never seen before. We have a historic moment in our region where we have four premiers, four governments at the Atlantic, uh, at the provincial level in Atlantic Canada with the federal government that are really aligned. And obviously everybody points to the, to the fact that we all carry the banner Liberal Party, but really it goes further than that. We are, we are friends, we've known each other in many cases for a long time. 
We are able to have frank discussions to overcome challenges and seize opportunities. And on top of that, we have a lot of the same approaches. Avec des approches similaires, nous sommes capables de travailler ensemble pour vraiment obtenir des résultats pour les, les uh, Canadiens de notre région. And I have to say that we're not only lucky to have, obviously, the four premiers sit at that table, but five phenomenal ministers from the region, uh, whether it's Lawrence, uh, Seamus, uh, Bryson, Ginette, and who's that other guy? Who's the, uh, Dominic LeBlanc, right, my, my, my MP. Uh, we have great partnerships with the five of them, but I have to add that Navdeep Baines uh, is doing a great job, comes to our meetings, he understands what we're trying to do in Atlantic Canada. Uh, Ahmed Hussain is coming uh, as well to our meetings because he holds a portfolio crucial to one of the, I think, other large challenges our region faces, which is an aging population. So with immigration being so important, he's been very involved in the Atlantic growth strategy. Uh, nous avons obtenu des résultats déjà qui fait vraiment un impact pour notre économie pour les, et pour les gens de notre région. We've been investing together in tourism. We work together on the super cluster for the oceans cluster that we'll have that will very much uh, contribute to economic growth moving forward in the future. Absolutely. And the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, which is really streamlining us, uh, helping us work with entrepreneurs to give them the skills that they need to be able to grow their businesses, start their businesses here in Atlantic Canada has been phenomenal. And on that note, I have to say that Atlantic Canadians have been amazing when it comes to welcoming new Canadians. I mean, Atlantic Canadians want us to focus, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Atlantic Canadians want us to focus on ensuring Atlantic Canadians can stay in the region, come back to the region, but they also understand that it's not an either-or question. We also need immigration, and I am very proud of what the region did during the Syrian refugee, refugee crisis, and I'm going to say that I'm very proud of the fact that New Brunswick in 2006, 16, uh, had the largest per capita amount of Syrian refugees come to our province to help in that crisis. Alors, la stratégie nous aide énormément à faire croître l'économie, and I have no doubt that the strategy, the Atlantic Growth Strategy, is going to help us grow the economy, better the quality of life for Atlantic Canadians, and also help us elect 32 phenomenal Liberal MPs in the next 2019 election. We couldn't agree more with him. So following on the immigration part of the Atlantic Growth Strategy, Wade, tell us a little bit what you're doing in Prince Edward Island because it's quite unique in, in some methodology in um, growing your population on that beautiful island of yours. So Goody, we uh, got our eye on what was taking place in Manitoba with the provincial nominee program and more or less learned our lessons there. Uh, and we're now um, a decade plus uh, into this. Last year we had the uh, largest uh, relative to our population base increase uh, in, by immigration uh, among the provinces. Uh, that is translating into a rejuvenation, you might say, of uh, our population, along with other ways in which uh, that, that's happening. Uh, and uh, the, what we've done now, and I'm, and I'm proud of this, uh, we've made a deliberate effort through a population action plan to encourage uh, communities and in turn people who are involved in uh, immigration, recruitment, retention, settlement, to focus on uh, communities outside of the urban areas. And we actually give, we've got a point system, we give higher, more points to uh, situations uh, where people will settle in um, what you might call rural or smaller uh, areas. And uh, people are really getting into that, and the communities are. Uh, so that's, that's very uh, encouraging. Um, overall, it's, 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 it's the same thing in, uh, that, that happens the world over. Uh, people are coming, they're coming to a, a better situation uh, than uh, you know, things that we can possibly not even imagine. Uh, they're committed, uh, they're happy to be in Prince Edward Island or in other provinces or in Canada. Uh, they are uh, engaged, the community is very positive in terms of the, um, the, 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 the kind of mutual engagement or the mutual, I might say, enterprise of uh, making a go of this. And then there's a further thing, and it's about five years out, there's a whole wave of innovation and enterprise that you can't even predict uh, that comes once you get that ball rolling. And we're beginning to see that, and we're very happy about it. 
And your 90 beaches and your 33 golf courses certainly help attract a few people too, I'm sure. And the housing prices. You, you and the housing that. price we alluded to earlier. So Stephen, I know a passion for you is um, economic growth. And can you just speak a little bit about the, um, the greatest economic potential in your province and why and well, what you're doing with well, it? Well, first of all, Wade might have 33 golf courses. We have the two best in North America, by the way. Oh, here we go. It's, I was wondering when this was going to start. Yeah. Such a good time. <laughs> Don't go there. You, you can tell I'm the one mo most recent just gone through my election campaign. I'm still a bit chippy. Uh, oh. No, seriously, from, from an economic point of view, it's not one sector, quite frankly. It's an, it's, it's, it is looking at how do we how do we take advantage and build on what we have in this region? And, and it, simplistically, to look at it as driving innovation, it's very much what Wade had just talked about, whether it is in our traditional sectors. For those of us who live in the valley, the agricultural sector is an important component. We had, we've been known around the world for, our, uh, for the apples that we produced. It was only been the last number of years through innovation that we realized we could grow Honeycrisp, uh, which provided a, a smaller yield in some cases, but a high value commodity that we could sell globally. That was only happening through driving innovation. What we're seeing from that is the next generation of young Nova Scotians are realizing there's a future in the family farm. We're seeing that, whether it is in, you, come, you move that now into what we're seeing with our post-secondary institutions. We welcome 20,000 young people from around the world to this province every September to go to university. <clears throat> and, and many of them see a future for themselves in this province, but they saw no opportunity. In 2013, our university presidents came together and we said, what, you are a fabulous educational institution, but what is your role in the economy? And we came together and through innovation, driving startups, we, have this, we had the largest number of startups in Canada on a per capita basis in this province, and that is because the universities and our private sector collaborated to provide opportunity for young people right here at home in Nova Scotia. We need to continue to take advantage of the things we have and build on them and recognize through innovation changing. The workplace of yesterday is no longer what my children and your grandchildren or children want to be part of. They want to be part of a workplace that is ever changing, something that's fulfilling for them individually and personally. They're less looking at where am I going to be in 40 years. They want to know what am I going to do tomorrow and what, what is the change going to happen in one year from now. And that's the kind of change in, through innovation that we need to do on an economic level in not only in Nova Scotia, but in this region. Because I'm going to tell you, without driving the economy, without being able to provide good jobs in the private sector, the health care that we all want will not exist. The education system will not be here. Those three balanced budgets for our province allowed us to provide a pre-primary program that every four-year-old, regardless of the socioeconomic circumstances you're born into, you're going to be right at the same start in this province, regardless of that. That's why we need to drive the economy, and the only way we can do that, in my view, is through innovation. And it's not to ignore the traditional sectors that we have in, 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 at the expense of what we believe is a new economy. It's actually to build on those traditional sectors as we're providing opportunity in a new economy. Wonderful. Well said. So taking your point of collaboration a little step further, Dwight, I know I heard it when I was knocking on doors, the relationship that the province, my province, our province of Newfoundland and Labrador had with the previous provincial government, had with the previous federal government. Uh, we heard that loud and clear, that that had to change. Um, I know it's changed, you know it's changed, but what difference has that made, that relationship, that positive working relationship with the federal government and the provincial government for you and your government and what we're doing in Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, thank you, Goody. And first and foremost, I go back to the Atlantic Growth Strategy just for, a few, just for a minute or so here, because I was the last premier to actually come to that table simply because of the election. Uh, so, you know, getting at that table was important to me, no matter what we did in Newfoundland and Labrador, is that we could only strengthen a change of place and where we are is if we could actually come together as a region. You mentioned earlier about having 2.3 million Atlantic Canadians. So when you look at it in comparison to some other provinces, you know, that would put us kind of in the middle of the pack as a region. So it was very important, and as I listened you know, to the premiers when I joined that table, it, it was very clear to me that what we wanted to do was find the areas that we could agree on. And we're always going to compete. We'll compete for our tourists, we'll compete for you know, economic development in some cases, but it was important for us that we find the consensus of the things that we could agree on and we work, with, we work on moving those things forward. And we've been able to do that. I think what Wade has mentioned earlier, the four of us here, quite frankly, when you see the dynamic of all of us, and generally, we are genuinely, I think it was Brian maybe who said it, we are genuinely friends. 
Like, I know the Flyers won last night because Brian and I have already had that conversation. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, it's important. So it's about the relationship that you mentioned, Goody, and you're right. I mean, we knocked on doors with you. And people in Newfoundland and Labrador, they wanted to see a stronger relationship uh, with, our, with our federal colleagues. They wanted to see a stronger relationship with Atlantic Canada. And just recently, we signed for the first time, and I really didn't even realize, uh, you know, the, the impact that this would have in signing a cooperative agreement with the province of Quebec. Um, yeah. So... So it is about relationships, and you know, no stronger relationship can I think, of when I look at right now, that's more important to us, indeed, is the one of the federal government. Uh, when I look at the supercluster that has been mentioned already, there's five superclusters in this country. I mean, I think it goes without saying that when you look at a supercluster, Atlantic Canadian as an ocean supercluster, it's kind of obvious. Uh, but we are actually being able to take and attract you know, federal money one-on-one -on -one with private money and continue to strengthen that relationship because it is, as Stephen said, it's all about strengthening the economy because it is indeed, it is indeed what pays for our social programs. And I will tell you, as we create the economic environment to attract that investment, I said in an interview that I did this morning, money goes where money is wanted. And as we try and develop that relationship with the private industry, if it's on our offshore with our fishery and so on, the relationship, the fact that the doors are open in Ottawa is acutely important for all of us to grow our economy because there's nothing more, there's nothing more that we can do for our young Newfoundlanders and Labradorians than help them find a job. It, then, and we can only help them find a job is we create the economic environment that means that we can attract the investment that's required to either uh, build on those programs. And I will just, one other thing that I want to say about the Atlantic Growth Strategy and the relationship that we have, Goody, is that let's not forget that we have one big laboratory in Atlantic Canada. We have an aging demographic, the opportunities around healthcare. People often talk about healthcare as being a challenge. I see healthcare as an opportunity. We can do things using broadband, digital health, with support from our, our federal government to make sure that we are not purchasing digital health province products, but indeed in Atlantic Canada, we are making them and we're selling them and exporting them to the world. I know you want to chip in, Wayne. Uh, if I may, Goody, on, on that question, in the, for the first eight months I was Premier, it was the Harper government, and I said, and I actually experienced it, they had the furniture up against the door. There was no, there was, the door was not open. And, and in, in that, when October of 2015, something very big happened for this region and for our country. And, and we talked with the Atlantic Growth Strategy, we can talk about what happened with the, the Canada Pension, the Fisheries Fund, the Agricultural Partnership, the, the, the infrastructure programs, the low carbon economy. And the one that I, that I want to point out that is bringing benefits throughout our region and across the country, and I don't think from the point of view of either provincial or federal governments, we acknowledge it enough, and that's the Canada Child Benefit. It's remarkable yes. what that has put into our provinces. You're right. That has touched so many millions and millions of families, and especially in Atlanta, Canada. I hear it when I knock on doors, and it's, it's, it's one of the best programs we have put forth. So, gentlemen, it's great we all have the oar in the water together, and we're pulling the same way. The stroke is the same way. That's great. But we know we still have more opportunities and more challenges out there. So what do you each see working together? What's our next big accomplishment? What's our next challenge that we're going to overcome and we're going to soar in Atlantic Canada by working together? Who wants to have a stab first? Wait, I'll give off you go. So I say the two challenges, and this is really a reflection of growth, that we have our workforce and housing. And uh, with workforce, and Stephen spoke about this, it's to have the workforce for the 21st century. We actually have lots of resources and programs and labor market, this and that and so on. But I think if it's to then turn our attention to how we, through a combination of population, immigration, but especially workforce development, we get where we need to be in 10 and 15 and 20 years. And then the second part is to recognize that while we have, haven't got the population density of the large urban centers, we do have in all of our provinces and communities challenges around housing and we need to be acting ahead or thinking ahead on those because it's a, it's a slower cycle or it takes a little more time. And I'll make one more point, Goody, and that's about that 21st century workforce because it's really about people 
living off, uh, people taking, moving ahead together, I'll call it. And uh, in our region and in all of our provinces, we've got some fa fabulous opportunities and actually some good relationships to make sure that the First Nations and Indigenous people in our region are part of that success story. Well said. Brian. Comme ça a été déjà mentionné, je pense qu'une population vieillissante est un défi qui, euh, donc on fait tous face ici dans les provinces de l'Atlantique. Et je pense que si nous sommes pour surmonter ce défi et saisir les possibilités devant nous, euh, Stephen l'a bien dit, euh, c'est d'innover. Ça va être à travers l'innovation que nous allons être capables de continuer à améliorer nos services de soins de santé, d'améliorer notre système d'éducation. Euh, ça va être à travers l'innovation en aidant nos industries traditionnelles comme les pêches et les fruits de mer à innover pour qu'ils soient concurrentiels au niveau international, aider les industries émergentes. Euh, de notre cas, euh, la cybersécurité, c'est une opportunité énorme pour la croissance économique au Nouveau-Brunswick. Uh, and with an aging population, there's no doubt that we have to work together. Uh, we believe that growing the population is one of the most important things that we can do to ensure we have a good, strong workforce for the businesses that are starting up and growing. And I was very pleased that in July of last year, New Brunswick has the largest population it has ever had in the history of our province. Absolutely. And I want to add uh, one last thing, that there's no doubt to overcome a lot of the challenges that we've spoken about al already today. And the opportunities that are before us as well, we do need the federal government. And I just want to echo what Wade said about how uh, there's no doubt with the Harper government that the door was closed and it's a good line, the furniture was up against the door. And you contrast that with the uh, Trudeau government where we meet to discuss the Atlantic growth strategy and we're all having a good time discussing important issues and how we're going to work together in Lawrence McCauley's barn on Prince Edward Island. I mean, uh, there's a bit of a contrast there between the two governments, I think, in terms of the uh, welcomingness of wanting to work with the provinces. So we can overcome the challenges before us, and I have no doubt by continuing to work together, we will grow our region and we will be successful. Dwight, I'll pass it over to you, but I'm also going to get a little plug in for broadband and internet and connectivity, especially in Newfoundland and Labrador. We know how important that is, and we need that to grow the economy. You know, it's related to education, healthcare, tourism, everything. So, Dwight, over. Yeah, you're right, Cody. No matter where you go, uh, broadband, access to good broadband, functional broadband, too, is, is, is really fundamental in everything we do to advance the economy and, and even some of the way we deliver uh, uh, health and, and education. I will say, though, and I want to just go back to an earlier comment, an earlier question, is that for the first time in the history of our province back in September, we had the federal government, the federal cabinet uh, meeting in St. John's. So we, we very much appreciate the show of support that came uh, from Prime Minister Trudeau. I, I did have a brief chat with him last night, and I said he should fire his travel agent, because I saw this week he's been a pretty busy guy uh, traveling around the world, but yet find time, found some time to be with a great crowd of liberals there. And before I finish, uh, finish because I know our clock is ticking there, I want to say a big shout out to uh, Nova Scotia, the host uh, of uh, this year's convention. You've done a great job. Here, here. It's a little known fact, I think, uh, that there's more pubs in Nova Scotia per capita. I think we, we chatted about this morning on a per capita basis than any other province. But no other province has the fun that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians do. But, <laughs> But I will say, uh, Stephen McNeil is the only uh, premier in the country that has his own beer. That's the real McNeil. <laughs> we did share one last night. But, but Goody, to go back to the challenges, and, and, and really, in, in my life, I, I more respond to challenges and constantly look to where the opportunities would be and how we, how we work uh, to, to get through those challenges. I mentioned earlier about, uh, about digital health. And as, I, as we look at the 2.3 million uh, Atlantic Canadians that we have available to us. When I look at that aspect of it, we have so much with an aging demographic, as Wade had said, with a strong indigenous community, uh, with uh, an immigrant. With, we have tracked by the way, in Newfoundland and Labrador, more immigrants last year than at any other point in our history. So which is really a testament to who we are as a province, but a testament to where we put the, our priorities at, at this table as well. So underlying all of this is, is a good functional broadband. We can deliver better healthcare services. We will do a better job with education. That means we're more attractive as a place to live and raise your family to invest in our provinces. So, you know, we can go on here. I'm not into an election. This guy just came off an election. This one, who knows? And Wade, you'll be before me. But I will tell you 
There is no better place on earth to live than Atlantic Canada, and I can tell you, the best country in the world is Canada, without a doubt. Here, here. Over to you, Steve. What was the question again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think we all have hit, the, 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 my, my colleagues have hit on the, I think the single issue is population. Uh, we need to grow the population in Atlantic Canada. <clears throat> and I can tell you how proud I am to be a Canadian and how proud I am of our Prime Minister who actually looks at our differences as an asset and not a liability. Yes, well said. <laughs> I am proud of the fact that when you walk through this city of Halifax and across our province, the face of this city and this province is changing because of immigration. And I think the single biggest thing we can do as a region, as a population, is to welcome more new Canadians to our region and allow them the opportunity that all of us have been given is to build a wonderful life for ourselves here. We should be exporting, we should be importing them to build on our dream here in Atlantic Canada. Without more people, we cannot deliver on the services that you and I and our families expect in this region. And on a final note, Dwight is right, I've just came off a campaign. My colleague next to me, Brian, is going into one soon. Wade will go and then Dwight will go. My challenge to all of you is to step outside of your individual province and join my colleagues as they go through an election campaign. <laughs> I can tell you election campaigns are difficult, as you all know, but there is nothing that puts more energy and gas in the tank for an elected official than to watch the legions of volunteers who wrote knocking on doors for no personal gain other than they want to see a liberal vision in their respective province and their region. I know I'm going to do whatever I can to help my colleagues get reelected. I think our region needs these gentlemen to be reelected because we need a long-term vision for Atlantic Canada and Canada. And let's accept this challenge as we head into the New Brunswick election. We're going to use it as a building block when we move into the PEI election. And it's going to be the launching pad for when we move into the Newfoundland and Labradorian election campaign. And we're going to send a trend here in Atlantic Canada that back-to-back -back majorities are a normal thing for, the, for governments. And we're going to do the same thing for Prime Minister Trudeau. So let's accept that challenge. I think this crowd is up for the challenge. We've got a record turnout here. And we're going to return all 32 seats federally back to, to Ottawa as well from Atlantic Canada. So gentlemen, the clock is ticking down. And I want to get serious for one minute because we've had a lot of fun. And I know you always have a lot of fun. But I researched around and I found a quote that I thought was truly fitting of you all, and that was before the days of gender parity. So please, it's from Harry S. Truman. Men make history. It's not the other way around. In periods in life where there is no leadership, society stands still. Progress will only occur when courageous, skillful leaders seize the opportunity to change things for the better, and they do just that. So I think you'll agree with me, folks, that these gentlemen have seized the opportunities, and they're always looking for the opportunities to seize. Please join me in thanking my colleagues from the four Atlantic provinces, the premiers here, for their words here today.